I have come here to chew bubble gum and kick ass. And I'm all out of bubble gum. Go ahead. Make my day. Cinema Royale. Hello, welcome to Cinema Royale, where we keep it classy most of the time. I'm Mike Mixtape, and let me introduce you to my fellow film aficionados tonight, the Brotherhood of Cinema here. First up, we've got James Sullivan, also known as Hami Dude. Tonight's broadcast is brought to you by Happy Cinco de Mayo, May uh, Revenge of the of the Fifth, May the Fourth be with you, and the actual sponsor of tonight, huh? And three, two, one. And the actual sponsor of tonight's show is uh, dissing Firefly on Twitter because Joss Whedon said something rude. <laughs> yeah. Mike. Less said the better. Exactly. And, and your reaction, Mike, was, was pretty key on that. I know. I was shocked. I was shocked. Um, last but not least, our favorite Canadian, Matt Brunet, also known as Animat. Hey, guys. Did you, say, did you say favorite comedian or Canadian? Canadian. Either way, I'll take it. Uh, today, yeah, I pretty much celebrated Cinco de Mayo today by posting stuff about a Disney film based on based in uh, renaissance france <laughs> that's how i celebrate it oh you mean uh saludos amigos <laughs> close enough it's not bad <laughs> uh, no it was the three caballeros of course <laughs> in the middle spot there it's sort of a goddess pleasure to see you here Okay, now I just want to watch that movie again. <laughs> when, when is Disney going to freaking release that on Blu-ray? Seriously. The three caballeros, three gay caballeros, you'll find us beneath the sombreros. <laughs> Tonight and today we're going to talk about movies that we love but everyone hates. This is kind of inspired by uh, Doug Walker's kind of main questions he asks all the time at the conventions you know he does this one and he does movies that we hate but everyone loves so i'm figuring hey what the hell we just talk about our own thing so tonight we tonight we got uh, a variety here one of us two of us has movies one person has a collection worth talking about so you know what james why don't you start off what the discussion you want me to do mine first <laughs> Okay, I, um, I was, uh, oh wait, so the Saludos Amigos and Three Caballeros is, uh, comes as a two-parter. I did not know that. Um, back to, yeah, back to reality. Um, I'm, yeah, tonight, uh, tonight, uh, my pick for tonight's movie is uh, something that I saw actually in the theaters uh, 10 years ago th this year on my birthday. And uh, a film that, that over the years I have been, I've been really, really surprised at, at how much at how much negativity has sprung up uh, against the film, or, or shall I say, how much, how much backlash there was, because because I was there in the I was there in the audience. Admittedly, I think they were I think they were uh, older people. Uh, and the film that I'm talking about is Mamma Mia. Yes, the ABBA musical that was. That was uh, dated in so many different ways before uh, before they decided to make a movie out of it. I I you I I just have to say I I love this movie. I do. I, I really do. I, I don't see what the what the what the issues are against it. The the premise is you have. Uh, you have uh, uh, a young a young gal played by Amanda Seyfried uh, living in Greece. Uh, her um, uh, she's she's gonna get married, 
and she's chosen her her mom's hotel as the as the place of uh, of nuptials, shall we say? And uh, uh, her mom, played by Meryl Streep, uh, has uh, has worked her her whole life to make sure that her daughter her, her daughter's life is uh, has has been exceptional. And who should show up at the at the wedding and the parties and whatnot, but um, Three men who could potentially, who who could potentially be, uh, Amanda Seyfried's father. But the problem is they don't know which one. Uh, she's uh, she's speculated uh, who they could possibly be. Um, uh, she's read through her mom's diary and everything, and she says, "Okay, because because my mom wrote." about this person back in her golden years uh uh they must be uh they they're a potential candidate to be the father or this one or this one i'd like to see all these people on mari i really would <laughs> that would be an amazing episode i would actually tune in and watch it. oh god <laughs> dear god and what i what i find interesting about it is I I'm not a fan of ABBA. I'm not. Uh, I didn't even like. Here's a here's a shot for you. I've never really liked Dancing Queen either. What? Oh. What? No way. I lay I laid that down I, because and the reason why I say that. Yeah, I I know I. Because that that I'm set, I'm opening my big mouth there because that was such a that was such a staple of ABBA music right there was uh, the the wonder that is dancing queen. Mm -hmm. um, I, the reason why I've never really liked it is because it see it um, it um, it did it did fit into that category. Of uh, of music that uh, that everyone one generation up really really uh, really really went haywire over for decades afterward, and you'd have to listen to your you'd have to listen to it be played at every school dance, and you'd have to watch you would have to watch your span you would have to watch your Spanish teachers dance to it right in the middle of class. No kidding, that happened at my high school. Um, but it for me, it was always too slow and too meh, and it was just one of those cases where it drove me crazy how how much how much this song could be appreciated. But I just thought it was eh. So, uh, Mama Mia, I I find. It it was an interesting look at the rest of, uh, for me at least, the rest of Abba's music, or at least in this case, putting doing something that the band themselves never really did, which is to put the music into a context, and that makes a huge difference, especially with jukebox musicals. And I actually think that it's a good story. I think that it's a. Uh, Okay, Mike, you're grinning. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm gonna have to hold it off because <clears throat> it's 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 not about the story that people kind of it's all about the performances, I believe, that people are kind of complaining. You can have you can have Pierce Brosnan singing when you're gone. That I that that I I, I completely X over. That's the only thing that I find laughable about this, but go on. Because a lot of critics are, like, quote, saying Pierce Bronson's singing was compared to a water buffalo, a donkey brain, and, of course, a raccoon. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. All Pier of those? Three different critics just described his singing as three different animals. <laughs> what? Wow. Does that mean we can have uh, 
like we could pretty much have a Mamma Mia where Rocket Raccoon is playing as Pierce Brosnan. <laughs> Where are all these carefree days? They seem so hard to find. <laughs> do, 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 do. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. I'm sorry. A wounded raccoon is what the quote does. A, a wounded raccoon, it sounds like. Okay, fine. A drunken rocket raccoon. <laughs> well, well, but... Has but, the critic ever listened to it? About me. <laughs> but, <Shut up. laughs> but there isn't a... Oh. There's another quote. Has that critic ever listened to an actual wounded raccoon? I don't think so. I don't know. It just, but there's actually another quote that says, the closest you can get to see A-list actors doing drunken karaoke. <laughs> hey, hey, Meryl Streep was, was good in that. I, I, I stand that by that. That seems like one. Who? What about Les Mis? That's the one where celebrities got drunk with karaoke. <laughs> <laughs> Do not forget my name. Do not forget me. Well, what, what what do you expect when most of the notes you're singing are the same two notes over and over? <laughs> and I'm Javert. Yeah, I mean, otherwise, yeah, that's typically what people are saying about is the performances more than anything else, I guess. I I don't. I don't hate the performances. I I think that um, yeah, some of them do come and go. Like like Super Trooper is just sort of seems like it's it's there for the girls to 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 have fun and uh, maybe voulez vu to an extent, but um, at at least those at least the sequences I are very are very lively. Uh, and there's there's actually some uh, there's actually some songs that that did get deleted from the film, but are actually on the on the soundtrack. Like um, there was one scene where Amanda Seyfried was supposed to sing the song "Name of the Game." Yeah. Cause I wanna know what's the name of the game. Do, 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 mm. do. Yeah, that's the only one that's deleted. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But. Um, yeah, other other songs that only really get uh, th there was another there was another song in the in the film that the that the uh, two older ladies only sing for like a a couple of bridges, but that that never made it onto the soundtrack. Not that I'm hugely missing that, but um, right. Yeah, soundtracks are an interesting case now where everything. Everything has to sound different in the movie version and the the soundtrack version. So, I don't know. Um, yeah, I I like I like the characters, I like the performances, and I like um, I I think it's a very uh, the the characters are are actually quite uh, are actually quite relate uh relatable it seems like it would it's a plot that would that would make sense if you were if you were somebody who grew up who never knew who your who your parent uh or your parent or parents were uh because uh because nobody ever talked about them that you might actually pull a stunt like this and uh, i like how i like how it lives within its it sort of lives within its own magical world where where um, it has fun with itself. Uh, it's a musical. What do you what do you expect? <laughs> oh my god, this review is this review is like horrendous. <laughs> Unfortunately, Streep and her ancient co-stars create pure torture whenever whenever on screen together. This is the Catwoman of movie musicals. The Catwoman? The Don't cat make me defend Catwoman. <laughs> one point one point five out of five. Guilty pleasure ish. Anyway. Yeah, I I did look at um I, I did look at um Oh wait, it was two thousand eight, not two thousand seven. Yeah, that was okay, nine years, years ago. ago. 
This came out. Yes. This came out like during the same like weekend as The Dark Knight, I believe, as well. So. Oh man, it, this was the day. Oh wow, this was the day right before. This was June thirtieth when this was released. The day right before my birthday. Yeah. Okay. So. <laughs> this. So this movie was kind of uh, was kind of gearing up for me, I guess. <laughs> Make that grandma mama mia. Grandma mama mia. Grandma mama mia. That should be a thing now. Let me... <laughs> Where are you? Where are you? We might be your. We might be your daughter. I have a daughter. What what is up with what is up with this review right here? It says, if this is a positive review, it says, like a big gay Terminator, <laughs> Mamma Mia will track down your cynicism and blast it into smithereens. It will absolutely not stop ever until you're having fun. Okay, now grandma. Okay, now grandmama Mia needs to have Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> in it. Yes, yes. I can. Expendables, but like Mamma Mia. Could you just it's like, imagine like, Arnold Schwarzenegger okay. singing? <laughs> Who's the dad? You have a choice of either Michael Caine, Sylvester Stallone, or Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> Why Michael Caine? I don't know. I was thinking of someone old. Or we might as well, or just bring back the cast of Going in Style and just put them there. Oh, jeez. <laughs> Okay, uh, I, Matt, I, 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 have you have you guys seen even seen this movie, or are you just shying away from it because it's too girly? Well, no, for me personally, well, it's not it's not too girly. No, it's I'm not. Fan, I, like I am a fan of theater, so yeah, it's not like I haven't seen personally. I haven't seen it yet. The most I have is just the nostalgia critic review. But what is interesting, uh, I, I do want to know from you, James. Have you seen the Broadway show? No, I have not. That could probably explain why you actually like it more. Because it, it, it could be a little bit of a reason why both of us enjoy uh, the producers. It's mainly, like, I have, well, I have seen the Broadway show, like, a little bit after I've seen the movie. No, but the thing is, is that, like, one, one of the key factors of how it's not really viewed upon as enjoyable is mainly of how, like, it seems vastly inferior compared to the Broadway show. And this was out during the time when Mamma Mia was one of the biggest things in New York. Like, in Times Square, it's practically synonymous where on the side, you actually do have uh, Mamma Mia. So, the, the thing is, is that Mamma Mia is definitely one of the more popular Broadway shows, and bringing that to the big screen is definitely no easy task. And often, when you do bring a Broadway show to the big screen, it's either like you can reap into the success and be reward, re rewarded greatly, like with films such as Chicago, or you might even fall flat and be seen as a joke. And unfortunately, that's where Mamma Mia comes in, because and like yeah, sure, maybe the perform like it could be possible the performances are not necessarily as great, and like you do end up getting celebrities whose talent are not really keen to musicals because that's another big thing considering that it is a musical you'd expect to hire someone who can sing and with pierce mm -hmm. brosnan maybe it's not the greatest I, the most idealistic choice i mean like when you have to cast someone for a big screen adaptation of broadway you also have to think would you bring this person onto the stage the thing about pierce bronson pierce bronson is um brosnan <laughs> You need to stop thinking about Death Wish. I, I, I love... I fucking love Charles Bronson, okay? I, I can't keep off my head, alright? So, Pierce. I'll just say Pierce. Fucking Pierce. Pierce. Okay, go on. So, with Pierce, he didn't know what he was being signed to when it comes to the movie. All he knew was it be filming Grease and had Meryl Streep in it. So, he wanted to sign up when it was anything with Streep. So, he didn't know it was Mamma Mia at first. <laughs> So he was going with a gamble, like, huh, it's going to be filmed in Greece and it's going to have Miller Street. This is going to be great for me. And ironically, 
ironically, that he he has uh, he has actually said before in an interview that he acknowledges that he's he, his performances were not uh, uh, were not exactly terrific. I did actually think that the second song that he sang, he did a little bit better with. Um, when all is said and done, only because that's a little bit more within his range and vocal tone. But um, yeah, when yeah the when you're gone number, uh, they actually show uh, he was actually on television uh, doing interviews around that time. He said, "Yes, this is a clip of Meryl Streep singing and me trying to sing." So, so he's yes, he was having fun with himself. If you want, if you want a better example, Pierce's voice is actually better suited for Irish ballads, and I found this out when I was watching the movie Evelyn, in which he plays, uh, in which he plays a, a father, a, a single father, uh, trying to. Uh, trying to gain custody of his daughter at a time when Ireland was uh, was not was uh, was not letting single parent single fathers do that, and uh, uh, he gets a job as a in the movie he gets a job singing at a bar and he's actually pretty good. It's not a musical style that I particularly like, but. His voice, he's got a little bit more rhythm. He's, he's a little bit more practiced there. It's not perfect, but it's it's more suitable for his style, I, th- I think. Because, than well, that's because, he's, that's, that's because he's part Irish. So if he's going to do Irish ballads, you know, he's got that voice for it at least. So, mm-hmm. so I guess that does cater to his voice more likely than anything else. Also, I just... Amanda's, go in, on. in terms of the rest of the cast, though, Amanda Seyfried... Uh, it, um, Meryl Streep. It, Streep is no is no stranger to singing. No, she's done that. She's done it in tons of previous roles. I, uh, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna uh, cite a more recent one because uh, she was purposefully bad singing in that. But ah, uh, okay. Um, yeah, Ju- Julie Walters. Freaking, I I can't I cannot believe that that that's uh. That's Mrs. Weasley, as one of as one of her friends, as one of Streep's characters' friends in the movie. Mm-hmm. Da- uh, dancing and chasing after Stellan Skarsgård like uh, like uh, Pepe Le Pew. <laughs> there's a, there's another review I've seen in here, and this one's this just says it's my two dads set to crappy Swedish music. Sorry, I had to make that joke. <laughs> I know, My... it, it seems bad of me, but there's a little, mm-hmm. there's just a little sprinkle of immaturity. <laughs> That's all we are anyways. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's just, I don't know. Well, when I was looking at, like, the the critics' reviews, like, it's, it's, it's like, mixed at most. It's at 50% of Rotten Tomatoes. I know we don't source Rotten Tomatoes as much as anymore because that's a, another topic, but it's, like... So it's like, it's like fifty percent Rotten Rotten Tomato, at least like fifty four or something, and then the crit, the audience is like sixty six percent. So just like, so it's it's kind of like I got like a cult following at least somehow. I mean, but I, there's some people that do actually hate the movie, like you know, like the nostalgia critic did the review of it and he didn't like it whatsoever. So there's Morgan. Morgan hates the movie. Uh, Devin hates the movie, and they're not gonna they. I, I can safely say that because they will tell you themselves. Yeah. Yeah, so... Steph loves it, though. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. But see, that's the thing. It's just, it depends on the person. I just allowed him on me because, you know, it's we didn't have talked about it before, and it's just... I mean, ABBA alone is just uh, an interesting group in general. I'm surprised. Uh, here's the thing. I, I just because, yet you don't like Abba, but you like Mamma Mia. So it's just it's weird how you don't like like. Wouldn't you think you didn't like the music in Mamma Mia if you didn't like Abba as a whole? Mm-hmm. 
Well, it kind of gives you context for the song. At least, like, it gives it purpose. Mm-hmm. You you have a reason to be singing it, singing about or or going at going after a goal for for singing about somebody, and yeah, that um, that makes all the difference. Yeah, because when you think about like many of the popular songs that came from movies and stuff like that, like "Let It Go" wouldn't be as popular today if we didn't have the visuals of like what Elsa was feeling during that whole situation, what what just happened beforehand and how she's pretty much feeling during the whole song and stuff like that. Like, we need that visual representation in order to remember Let It Go as, like, one of the more popular and powerful songs that Disney currently has. Mm-hmm. I, I guess that does make sense because sometimes with jukebox musicals, they'll have, like, the popular song just go right in, but sometimes it doesn't have... A connection per se like how the, the characters are emoting to and that's i guess what mama mia, uh, mama mia does with its songs they try to p- pick songs to use for the characters to express through song and that's what the problem with rock of ages was and i was i was just thinking about that as i was saying that because their song choices in rock of ages they do kind of i can understand why they chose the songs like the, it was in the original like musical thing but then you know you, you would understand if you know the characters a bit better but yeah it depends on the yeah, musical yeah. with mama mia they worked around the the, the framework of the music oh yeah 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 yeah, 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 yeah. right yeah and at least like one thing that i can say is that like what like what did work like at least the elements that did function in the movie like since it is based on a musical it's mainly because like they did bring it on to the musical so mm-hmm. that could be you know that, that could explain something <sighs> so that's that's my movie that uh, that I like that uh, not, maybe not everybody else hates but let's let's be honest yeah let's how just many fans are you gonna pick how many fans are you gonna pick up on I mean even even um I, 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 even the uh, Weird Al made fun of it in one of his songs. Ah, uh, right, 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 right. Um, well, uh, let me do something before we transition to something else. Here we have a little surprise in the podcast today. Oh. Da, 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 da. Stupid camera! Come on, turn! Damn it! There we go! There we go! Cinema Royale, guest starring Bradley Cooper. <laughs> hey, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Whenever I have a light like this, I just gotta do this. Love oh. story. Horror story. It was the darkest story of the night. <laughs> Nicholas Sparks movie. Universal. Ooh. Hey, tablet boy. <laughs> I was just uh, discussing my film, uh, uh, which which I know is also one of your favorites, um, Mamma Mia. I've never seen it. What do you mean you've never seen it? I only saw half that film, and that was it. Um, my mother's seen that movie before. I can't remember her opinion that well, but I remember the only thing she said was Brian, not Brian, uh, Pierce Brosnan can't say. Oh. I thought... What? Wait, why'd you, wow. why'd you think Morgan's seen all the way through? <laughs> because, uh, because I, re- I, st- I specifically remember sending it Singing it, sending it to him uh, a couple of years ago, uh, titling it some "Fun and Happy Summer Movie" to try and cheer him up because he was going through a tough spot. And he responded with some, "Fun and Happy Summer, Fun and Happy Summer Movie, my ass." <laughs> oh, now I remember it's because of the Nostalgia Critic episode. That's why. Yeah, that's what that, it was. was that, that that was before the Nostalgia Critic episode. Was it? I think so. I'm pretty sure. Oh well. 
Well, we had this conversation before anyway, so... <laughs> okay, we'll, we'll have to chalk that one down as a summer watch, then, you know? <laughs> uh, oh, God, what have you done? Oh, no! Because you keep bringing up these ideas. <laughs> Is this because I tricked you guys in watching Manos, The Hands of Fate? I mean... Uh, that's, a God, that's a blessing. <laughs> well, you, you weren't there, Matt. That's why. <laughs> Wait. Was it? It's, yeah. it was just James and I. He was he was trying to... What? 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 No. No, 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 no. Remember the whole Ghostbusters fiasco? Mm-hmm. No, and I then mean, I told Matt... Like, I must have... Like, I remember watching Manos... That's the thing. Yeah, yeah. So why, so why did Mike all say, "Oh no, we weren't there"? <laughs> maybe I'm. God, maybe I remember suck nowadays. What the fuck? I don't remember don't Matt. Remember Mike. I don't remember. Your don't... memory sucks something. You suck something. You suck something, James. <laughs> okay. So. Very creepy, Morgan. <sighs> I'm Uncle Fester. Okay. Okay, so at least I'm half right. I remember Devin hates the movie. Mm -hmm. There so, you go. Yes, and I I did not I did not defend Pierce Brosnan singing. What I said was he did better in the second song, but even he acknowledges in interviews that he that he was pretty bad and that he's actually done better singing in other movies. But everyone else's performances, though, on the other hand, I thought they were great. And I thought it made a it made a huge difference putting ABBA songs in context to a, a story that I find I, I find actually likable with uh, with decent characters. Oh, oh, now I remember why I refused to see it because I thought the plot was a little questionable. Yeah, she she has three dads. Oh, I don't care how many I don't care how many how many men you slept with. I love you just the way you are, mother. Oh sure, and then four other husbands come to the aisle, and it's like, hi. It's a it, story about polygamy. It was. A, it, <laughs> no, no, paint your wagon is about polygamy. It was a, it was a freaking one-off. Seriously, seriously, Clint Eastwood, Lee Marvin, all trying to sing in a 1960s musical, based off of a Broadway move, Broadway production. That was about interracial marriage and not polygamy. How messed up is that? Okay. Yeah, yeah. That's how that's how screwed up that movie is. And then they visit Finian's Rainbow after that. Um, hey, at least Finian's Rainbow was the better film. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're so... not gonna win me over. You're not gonna win me over for the climax involving the whole town being collapsed because of some gold tunnels. I'm gonna stick with bigoted senator turned into a black man. Thank you very much. He's turned into a into a black Colonel Sanders. <laughs> God. Shoe polish and everything. Here to the word of the bee cat in my Kentucky Fried Chicken. Oh, and delicious gold sauce. Mmm, num num. Okay. It's just it's just barbecue sauce and honey mustard, but go on. Okay, I I was done with my segment. Yeah. Oh, all much. right. Yeah. So, I'm glad we got got some corrections on the record there. There you go. Mm hmm <laughs> Good for that. So let's just hop into the next uh, little train of thought here. Let's go with Matt this time. With me? Yeah. All right, so I actually have a really interesting pick for this one. It's not necessarily a movie, but a bit of a collection of movies, in a way. Because this is something that I've noticed that, specifically in the anime community, this has actually been very hated. And what I'm talking, of course, is actually about... Spirited the... Away. Uh, almost. <laughs> <laughs> I said nothing. It's you not my... I, I said nothing. You I said nothing. I had night terrors. That's, I had night terrors. That's James' that fault. Night terrors. Blame James for saying that. that James. Night terrors. Okay, sorry. Matt, go on. Uh, so, well, it's close enough. It's actually the Disney dubs of Studio Ghibli films. 
Oh, yes. And the reason why I say that is that mainly it really does receive massive backlash. And already the fact that it is an English dub, it already would go and receive a lot of crap. Considering that there is uh, one part of the anime community that passionately hates English dubs. Like, they think English dubs are the devil. If anim if you see Japanese anime characters talking in English, like, they will have an allergic reaction. They will get triggered. Like, absolutely triggered. I remember there's this, um, like, one commenter. I reviewed um, Hulk. And there's this one guy who got so pissed off that I reviewed the English dub of it. And, like, he pretty much told me, he was like, Oh, why don't you put on the subtitles? Or why don't you learn how to speak Japanese? Oh, let me guess. You're not doing it because you have other things to do. So, yeah, legit, the guy yeah. told me that, <laughs> like, if I need to review anime better, I need to learn entirely learn another language. So, yeah, there is an entire... It, like this is not of course this is not all anime fans but there is a sec uh, like a section of them who passionately hates stu uh, not studio ghibli film but like they hate english dubs in general it has to be subtitled and stuff like that so it already know, has that it already has that bad rep over there but we know these people as weaponese <laughs> <laughs> someday i'm going to show you that ones who watch hentai are weaponese oh god now i know <laughs> Oh god, now I know I gotta show you guys the Father Ted episode where Ted upsets the Chinese pe Chinese folk on the island. I like uh, but anyways, uh, some of you might be wondering, why is it that the Studio Ghibli dubs would immediately get this massive hate? Well, um, interestingly enough, it's more towards the, um, the earlier works. Uh, films such as My Neighbor Totoro, Kiki's Delivery Service, uh, Porco Rosso, the, the ones from the late 80s and the early 90s. Because beforehand, before Disney actually went and acquired uh, the rights, or like before Miramax came in when it was owned by Disney, decided to do a distribution deal with uh, Studio Ghibli, is that they wanted to go and do... Um, well, like beforehand, they already had English dubs already made, and then Disney decided to step in. And when they wanted to re-release them, like on DVD and Blu-ray, they decided to create their own English dubs. But this time, considering that it was handled by Pixar people like John Lasseter, Andrew Stanton, mm -hmm. and Pete Docter, like they would treat it like they would with their animated, like with their Pixar films, and they would bring mm -hmm. in A-list celebrities to go and voice them. Now, the result that would happen is that those dubs would often get massive backlash, even like the ones that would come after it, where the only dubs would be just the Disney dubs. Like, people would just hate on it, and they feel like the celebrity voices would kind of ruin the experience, and that they feel like it's much inferior to the previous version that it would have. Uh, probably the greatest example of all this is Kiki's Delivery Service, where often they would add lines and, like, they would alter a few things. Like, not necessarily alter scenes, but they would alter some of the dialogue, especially with the character of Gigi, uh, which in the Disney dub is played by Phil Hartman, that they would keep... Like, he would keep ad-libbing again and again and again. And people really didn't like that. It was down to the point that it, it got so controversial that when Disney re-released Kiki on blu-ray in 2012 they had to have a new version of the uh disney dub where they had to cut no. down a lot of the lines especially from phil hartman's gg okay um, phil that that was one of phil hartman's last performances yeah they 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 dedicated that they dedicated that uh, that dub to him how why do you hate it why would you people hate on it because people care more about Kiki and the originality of it than Phil Hartman, I guess. I don't know. But, but I, Phil let me Hartman. Tell you. It's like it's like saying Hold it's on. like it's like re-releasing Aladdin on Blu-ray and say saying we need to cut down on Robin Williams' roles. Role. Well, yeah, I I well, I went there. Yeah. You think uh, that's but bad? The one thing I will, so can I get to my defenses? Yes. <laughs> 
Yes, okay. yes, I'll but save myself. But the thing is, yeah. why I actually enjoy them is that the English dubs, like, they still do a pretty good job. Like, uh, the example with Gigi, like, yeah, even though maybe Phil Hartman does ad-lib one too many times where sometimes it would feel a little bit unnecessary, considering that he would definitely go off the script to how the original Japanese film was. But, like, sometimes it can be enjoyable, and even a lot of the acting, is even in Kiki, like, a lot of them are great, actually. And I think there is actually one perfect example of how the Disney dub can definitely be superior. Uh, e yeah, it could be superior even more than in the original English dub, and that is with Porco Rosso. I love Porco Rosso, one of my favorite Ghibli films right there. I was going to mention also the soundtrack choices in Kiki. Excellent. Oh, the, yeah. yeah, that's, yeah, well, the soundtrack, Go on. That's, that's an entirely different story right there. Um, no, but Porco, the Rosso. Porco Rosso is that I listened to the original English dub, um, like, it, it was purely out of coincidence. Like, I wasn't even looking uh, for the Disney dub. I didn't, like, beforehand, I didn't even know there was an, uh, an English, uh, like, a previous English dub. And it honestly sucked. It, like, it really felt off, and everybody felt like they didn't necessarily care when they were acting. And, like, uh, even some of the voices, they sounded like, uh, they, they sounded way off. They did not sound like who they were supposed to be. Like, a great example is, uh, like, uh, the big boss, uh, I forgot his name, it's like Big Mama Boss or something like that. And, like, for some reason they made him sound like a complete goofball, like, Hey guys, that's Poco Rosso. We're gonna go and get up there. Hold on, I gotta go and try to catch Froggy. God, I have to cross from Dumberware. Questionable. Yeah, you laugh now, but that's the legit voice that they gave to the guy. But so they gave him a big the cat voice. Yeah, is what you're that's saying. What they did. Um, but then when you go to the Disney dub, it is far superior they hired actors who actually knew oh what oh, they oh, were. Oh, 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 oh is the character's name mama autobots mama autobots yes that's him that's exactly who i'm referring autobots autobots is a symbol <laughs> <laughs> no actually his real voice would be like yo man check it out porco rosso's on the side we gotta go get him man <laughs> <laughs> great so great so so Cheech Marin is now so Cheech Marin is now a transformer that's wonderful <laughs> yeah pretty much <laughs> no but in the Disney dub however they really got an all-star cast and they fit the role perfectly you actually Michael got Keaton. Michael Keaton playing as Porco Rosso you got Susan Egan uh playing as the female uh, like the female lead in you got the villain, uh, who is the American pilot, funny enough, played by... Oh, dear God, I forgot his David name. David Ogden Stiers? Is that... No, 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 no that's not... Harry Elways? Harry Elways, yes. Played by oh, Harry yes. Elways. David Ogden Stiers actually does play a... Um, like, he, he plays this Italian character. I believe... I think it's in this one as well. They have John... Oh, no, no, no. That's not... No, no, no. That's actually in... Uh, they mind. also have... They I was also have Brad Rick Garrett... Rick yeah, and especially, that's the thing. Mama Autoboss, he's actually Brad Garrett in this movie, and he fits the role Raymond. perfectly. Because the thing is, is that the like the boss is supposed to be this Bluto-type character. So Brad Gar Garrett is a perfect role for him. It is so much better. I could definitely tell you that. Hmm. So that's kind of the thing, is that... Well, with Studio Ghibli films, I feel like they definitely do get such a bad rap, but the performances that are delivered in there, they're definitely fantastic. Even in the films after it, like the ones after the original English dubs are done and it's just purely Disney, like they can be great. Like The Wind Rises has a lot of really fascinating performances. Like they, they have a lot of great performances. Uh, so does Spirited Away, that has some really good performances. Uh, and so, like Princess Mononoke, that's actually pretty good. And yeah, like it was like honestly, I feel like it's just getting a bad rap for nothing. I don't know if it's just because of the fact that it's an English dub, or the fact that 
you know, they're just using big name celebrities to voice Studio Ghibli films, but honestly, I feel like their performances right there, you know, they do help tell the story of uh, what people like uh, Hayao Miyazaki, Aiseo Takahata, or any, uh, or like uh, Hiromasa Yonebayashi would tell in this. Like, it's honestly really good. Like, I understand if you want to watch a movie that's like purely Japanese, like, if they're going really on that scale, like uh, The Tale of Princess Kaguya or Pom Poco, then yeah, I can understand why you want to go and do the Japanese dub. But honestly, a lot of them, like the Disney dub, they do a great job. You know, yeah, I, I gotta think, give that credit. I think, um, and, 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 and to go beyond that, you know, uh, the, some of these guys they bring back, like Susan Egan, Susan Egan had done uh, other... Uh, uh, other Ghibli dubs before one we already mentioned. Um, uh, so that's the only two she did: Porco Rosso and she did Spirited Away. I don't know. Okay. Gross. And Carrie Elwes also yeah. did The Cat Returns. Yep, and uh, actually, he did but, both Cat Returns and Whisper of the Heart. Like he played okay. the cat in both films. Okay, and we got uh, and we also had Anne Hathaway in The Cat Returns, who, who did a who. I thought did a great performance. Oh yeah, her yeah um, she was really fun in this. But that's actually that's actually one where the performance in like the performance in a Studio Ghibli film is actually a lot of fun. Like with both with Carrie Carrie Elways with Anne Hathaway and I forgot his name. I, I apologize, but the the guy who played Muto. Mm. Okay. So I I can't I can't speak for other particular situations like um um uh, my neighbor is the yamadas which i have not seen uh, or or uh, uh my na my neighbor totoro which i have not actually seen in english but um i have and it's annoying <laughs> i do know this much um uh, whenever whenever the they they do dubs of ghibli movies and this is a trend that they that they started here, is that they always wanted to make sure that everything was was put into a context that they thought American audiences would try to understand. Which, when you're when you're going across socio cultural barriers, uh, uh, they might we might not understand different hand signals, or or what have you. So they. So there are a few minor changes that have to be made, and and then there's some cases where perhaps the film is better left off in its own country, like Pompoko. But uh, which is what which is actually the one that I'm I I would actually like to discuss here because um, because of their pouches because you know, of their pa that's what the kids call it nowadays their pouches. Their pouches and their sticks. There are so many jokes, it's it, it's not even worth it. If I say one thing about that, you guys would think of me in a different light. So I'm gonna explain. I'm gonna explain why it doesn't work. Other than the obvious reasons. <laughs> I I think <laughs> Pompoko is generally speaking a film that I think. Would would have uh, would have done better maybe as an American remake as it, uh, with uh, uh, with those touches all together, but looking at I I did actually see the Japanese dub and then later compare it to the uh, American dub, which in terms of star talent they got Jonathan Taylor Thomas. <laughs> yes. To play the lead, to play the lead raccoon, it's it's not a terrific movie by any means, but the jokes uh, uh, when you when you have to uh, uh, take something like this over and aim it at kids, uh, you know, as we have obviously testicles are a huge taboo over here, you know, showing that in, in children's films. Especially if you're going to use them as parachutes and uh, giant uh, battering <laughs> giant battering rams. Uh, it's a giant testicle. Duh. 
But with this, you have... With this film in the Japanese dub, you have such terrific lines uh, that that translate as um, you know one. Uh, there's one particular scene where uh, an elderly, an elderly uh, tanuki is training younger tanukis. They're all sitting on a mat together, and he says, and he says to him, uh, "And now we will begin today's lesson. But before we do that, I would like to explain to." explain to you all that you are all now sitting on my testicles. Oh yeah, and then afterwards you just see it's like Yes. It 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 retracts underneath him like someone pulling out the rug and it that line works there. That that line works there because he said he's casually saying you are all sitting on my testicles. <laughs> That's what's funny about it because he would not be saying that. And then the no, American he would be crying at that point. You, you are all sitting on my testicles right now. See, joink. And and to have the American dub come in and say, "But you do not know what you are sitting on." My pouch. Yeah, sure. <laughs> their pouches, <laughs> but and so far they still keep their sticks, in which they hope they meet a lady so that they can put their sticks in a pocket. They do do. They did keep that in the dub. Uh, there is there is some stick uh, there is some stick um, stickiness to be had in the in terms of the film. But here's here's the funny thing. They explain they explain in the dub version. Uh, their their love became too passionate. You see these two raccoon characters fall off screen together, and they say. And in the dub version, they make sure to say they were married and they had children next spring. I'm like, well, that the marriage the marriage part was definitely not in there in the in the Japanese dub. <laughs> because this children that is in there. This has been awkward sex education with Highway Two. Please leave your tips at the door. Thank you. Speaking of sick raccoons, <laughs> do you even bring it up? So, I no, get, no, what I'm no, trying no, to no, say. Talk, no, uh, more. I just want to say, Morgan, you do, you don't understand because apparently we were reading uh, Mamma Mia reviews and someone compared Pierce oh. Brosnan singing to a sick raccoon. Oh, oh, and oh! I, to which I said, "Has this critic even heard a, a um, an injured raccoon?" I believe it is. I, I, I just imagine just typing up a review and then you're like, nah, nah, nah. Oh, it's a secret raccoon. <laughs> Step away from the can. <laughs> Sorry, RJ. <laughs> I was like, what are you doing? <laughs> what are you doing here? I'm making children for next spring. I don't want to grow it. No! 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 <laughs> you know we already have that. It's called the Fate of the Furious. Thank you very much. Hey. Oh yes. Hey. Oh. Dwayne Johnson as the receiving tree. I don't know. Those two fight quite a lot. Like a couple. Okay. So yeah, what I'm trying to say is basically I can understand why. Why some some dubs would be hated? Did I get the point across? Yeah, I th I think for me there's a certain rule that comes across when it comes to dubs. If if they cut stuff out of the original, that works better in the context of the original language version. I'll definitely see the original subtitle version first, and then compare it to the other versions, see what it's like. And a perfect example of that is Nutcracker Fantasy. 
unfortunately, there is no subtitled version. So when I was reviewing that movie for Vaulting, I literally had to watch both films side by side and understand what was what was altered just based on what they did with the original dub. Um, strangely enough, they did remaster the movie. Keyword, mm-hmm. remaster in the sense of George Lucas special editionalized. So they added in like some digital effects. They cut some scenes out. Um, a lot of the ballet scenes that existed in the original cut are completely excised. Um, oh, but those were so pertinent to the original cut. Yeah, <laughs> even even Pennywise the Clown got the axe. What the hell? Oh. That was so beautiful. Um, I wonder he's getting a two-parter. <laughs> so, um, in that sense, what I always like doing is watching the original version and then seeing what they did over here. Um, just to see if it was like anything that was left out that was lost in translation, any difference. Um, it's the same principle with the Godzilla movies and stuff, and even the land maze alike. Because to me, it's so crucial to find out what was different between the two. Now, there are some cases where I'll just straight up cheat and just see the dub version for the sake of time, or just because, you know, if there really isn't much of a difference between the two, then why not? Um, and in most cases, that is with the Studio Ghibli movies. Because, for the record, I've supposedly heard in an interview, and I don't know if this was a joke or not, that Hayao Miyazaki has always stated whenever he wants his movies dubbed, he will straight up lift up a samurai sword and say, whatever you do, no cuts. No, 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 that was like the one, yeah, that was the one instance when um, it was, uh, like, it was working, it was with Miramax. And they oh. were distributing uh, Princess, Princess Mononoke. Okay. Harvey yes. Weinstein wanted yes. to do all these cuts and stuff like that. And the only thing they did is just they sent a samurai sword to Harvey Weinstein and they just said oh. no cuts. So it's just right. that one instance. It's all not right. Cause, like. Because I, I heard it different from a friend of mine, so I just wanted to be sure. Um, so in the case of Studio Ghibli films, if they're as faithful as they are to the original dubs, I watched the English version first. If there's an exception between, you know, with Poma, uh, Poma Poke, I'll definitely watch that one as well. It just really varies on how it changes the story in context of what it does with the terminology and such. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Actually, I just remembered there is this one example that I recently recalled, and it was something that actually did traumatize Hayao Miyazaki. So why is it that he's very strict when it comes to cuts and that he wants 100% control? And that is actually with Nausicaa of the Valley of the Wind. And that is actually an example of where the English dub can go horribly wrong. Now, thank, that this is actually another great example of Disney dub is actually far superior than the original English dub. And I forgot what, what was it called. It's like, uh, like I, I forgot, what was it? Princess of the Wind or something like that. And it like they had to cut that thing so much, and it made absolutely no sense. Like it turned into a completely different movie. And the poster, like if you know what uh, Nausicaa of the Valley of the Wind is, it is so it's like laughably bad. Yeah, it's like uh, Starship Troopers only done Japanese style artistically. Yeah, and with a heavy-handed anti-war message. Yeah, it's yeah, and it's really good. But if you've seen what they did to the, oh, uh, if you've seen like the original Warriors, that, Warriors like, of the Wind is what it's called. Warriors of the Wind, that crap! Oh god! Now that is a joke. That is a massive joke right there. Hmm. Yeah. I. I have not seen that version. I saw the American dub. And uh, I do, if I do recall, uh, I have a Japanese neighbor that uh, uh, that regards that movie as a classic. So, um, I'd, I'll be avoiding the other dub then. Winning. Mike is silent. He's taking notes. Mike is planning world domination. Of course! 
Mike is right. Mike is writing up the uh, the statement for the pizza party. Indeed. Uh, Morgan, Morgan, did you want to talk about something on here? Oh, yeah, no, I remember. There is a reason why I'm on here. Um, <laughs> Where did you come from? Uh, over here. <laughs> okay, so it was hard for me because technically when it comes to a movie that people really hate but I enjoy, they mostly fall into the category of guilty pleasures. But, uh, stuff like stuff like Prometheus, Alien Three, The Flintstones. Quintessentially, they're films where I understand there are flaws. It's problematic. I understand exactly why people can go in and not like it. But there's something very weird, something very strange, some bizarre charm to it that I really appreciate about it. And I think, in a sense, it's something we're going to talk about. We do like guilty pleasures down the road. Yeah, we will. But but in terms of a film that people really really hate that I enjoy um I was thinking about this movie that I think better fitting for the weekend the only one that honestly comes to mind most of the time is really Howard the Duck which we have not talked about before I, actually thinking about it now have we had we had did, to have talked about it before we had, did we? zero percent I believe Wasn't we zero percent on Rotten Tomatoes that episode. No, uh, talk but, about it again. but that no, never I never had a zero percent. No, that no, James, we did that, and then that that was probably on the list at the time, but it's probably changed since then. But oh, right, it was Garbage Pail Kids. Yeah. That's, yes. Uh, yes. yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that it, shit right there. When <laughs> we when we talked about comic book movies, however, I didn't think we mentioned Howard the Duck at all because Morgan wasn't even on that episode at the time. So uh, I know I know we were doing Marvel vs. DC with Lenny Cara. There but was a slight mention. There was, was very brief. It was. It was. I was going to say it's a brief it mention, so we didn't have a full discussion about Howard the Duck, however, which... He, com- he he that guy that dude shut it down like that Mor- poor morgan over here i wanted to hug him <laughs> i had the script i, I know the script that's yeah. all i cared about that film yeah so oh i never read how the duck what kind of comic book geek you are winky <laughs> so okay so wh- what okay why do you like howard the duck how is it? How how is it not a guilty pleasure? Like, because there's a difference between guilty pleasure and movies that we love that everyone hates. Why is it not so guilty pleasurey? Well, what? like I said, it's hard. As I was trying to say, it's hard for me to choose when a movie I think is interesting, but everyone else says, "Oh, it's got up because it's this, 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 this." It's difficult for me to process because it's like, well. Yeah, I understand where people are coming from with those problems, but there are certain things that I will say in defense and appreciate. Like, yeah, there's this element, but there's also that, and that, and that, and certain things do link up here and there and kind of sort of make sense. And to counter that as an example, there's stuff like Ron Howard's Grinch, where there's points where it works and points where it doesn't work, because you have Jim Carrey yucking up to the camera, and the old little innuendos and adult jokes that kind of falter away from its, you know, nice, heartway message and its childlike abilities. Um, another example, Waterworld. That's a movie where it was literally this big sci-fi apocalypse film, but what brought it down in the process was the editing. It, yes, exactly. It was chopped down so much to the point where it was literally next to nothing, but an okay science fiction movie with a great performance from Dennis Hopper. In terms of Howard the Duck, I feel like it's a case where the elements were there to make an interesting, fun movie, but I think people were expecting something big and huge at the time, but yet they didn't know really what to make of it. Um, just to give you an idea, I used to have a video store down at a corner area at a little corner shop, and I remember going in there, and at the time, I remember seeing this VHS tape for it on the shelf. And I always wondered, okay, well, what is this? That's, you know, interesting and weird. And I saw George uh, Lucas's name to it, and I was like, whoa, he did this? Well, this kind of could be interesting. Um, And so when I was a teenager, I rented it for the first time out of curiosity. 
because I had this book of Marvel um, characters and stuff. I think I might have shown one. It's like a huge, huge thick book. It's like bigger than the Bible in terms of size. Ah, see what I did there? Um, and I remember the very last section after the Punisher was How the Duck, and it mentioned very briefly its publishing history, and when it got into the details of the movie, it felt like it was more of a critical slamming than an actual praising or an actual going into, oh, this happened and this happened, so forth and so forth. So at the time, I was wondering, okay, why do people really hate this film? There's got to be something terrible about it. So... Um, I rented it that one time, I sat down, watched it, and at the, po- at the time I had really no opinion of it. I was more or less watching and seeing what is really bad about this film, what, what quintessentially is god-awful about it. And I remember thinking to myself, I can see why there are moments where it can't work, but at the same time there's something interesting about it. So I put that off to the side for a bit. And then during the high school years, there was this interesting submergence where I started finding out that it had a cult following, and there were people that actually did enjoy it. And so I thought, oh, okay, I didn't think it was awful, I didn't think it was terrible by any means, there were certainly things about it that didn't rub me the wrong way, there were elements I did appreciate. So I gave it another watch, and I think I started realizing this is quintessentially a 1980s B-movie with a big budget. A big, big, big budget. Mm -hmm. This film could have worked if it was... Let me just say the writers on the film say that this movie wanted to be an animated film. And I think that would have been interesting. If it was animated, if they did it the original way, there could have been something interesting. But Universal and George Lucas wanted a live-action, big-budgeted summer film. They wanted something to be akin of, say, Ghostbusters or Star Wars, and George thought this could work. And transitioning into live-action has its unique abilities and faults. Today, we live in a world with CGI and possibilities. We can get around the bend and actually do a whole lot more. Um, We're in a case where audiences are more accepting of weird and out-there kind of concepts. Back then, it was so foreign to them that you could might as well say the movie itself might have been ahead of its time, or there were some points where the execution was off, and I do fault it for stuff like Tim Robbins and his weird geeky personality, or the love... Um, the, the romance the, the, between him yeah, and the, 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 roma- the romance. Yeah, that gets a little awkward at some points, but there, there's something nice and charming about them, like they're both roommates, in, in a sense. Um, I think the film would have been fine if maybe it wasn't done by a big-budgeted studio. Maybe if it was scaled back a little and done as a straight-up, you know, quintessential B-movie. And I think that's where Lucas really wanted to go, you know, for that sort of direction. Mind you, I love the comics. I really love the comics. And that's because they're out there, they're absurd, and I don't give a care. Before Deadpool came along, this was quintessentially the 1970s Deadpool. The only difference is that there was story, there was character, and the commentary of Howard is that he was the strangest thing on Earth, and yet there's all these other weird things that happen around them. There's one where he, go up, where he goes up against a Canadian that dresses in a beaver costume and tries to get revenge at him for something. I'm not even making this up. I swear, I am not making this up. Matt, what are you doing in this in this comic? <laughs> <laughs> Dressed up as a beaver? <laughs> Canadian. Hell, there, hell, there's even... it, it was a weird phase of mine. <laughs> hell, there's even. Hell, there's. Yeah, well, why there's... are you trying to kill Cow- Howard the Duck? That's what we're asking here. <sighs> yeah, if I remember, right. if you want, if you want the long story short, what happens is in the issue before Howard tries to run for president. But someone pulls the plug on it by leaking a scandalous photo of Howard and Beverly in the same tub, even though it's obviously edited together. Mm. Okay. So it's supposed to be a parody of the Richard Nixon scandal or something like that. 
um, there's, they, they did a lot of great social commentary at some points when it worked. A good example was this anti, uh, how, do I, how do I put this? There's this group that wants to literally clean up, you know, dirtiness and all that sort of stuff. So they attack rock groups and dirty porno films with exploding brooms or something like that because they're symbolized as janitors literally cleaning up the filth of America or something like that. Um, it was that kind of comic. It was literally being crazy absurd and not giving a care while also having like this point of view of America and how bizarre it is in the form of something that is even more unlikely, even more unlikely that we can consider something that is not even average and strange. And I think trying to make a movie out of that has its pros and cons. Like I said before, if they did it as an animated film, it might have done better because in animation you can get away with uh, get away with more with suspension of disbelief because it's in its own environment. In a live action universe, you have to tally up and consider the um, physics and everything that happens in this environment, the capabilities of the real world, and how it mix and how it mingles in with the fantasy elements. That's why stuff like Ghostbusters work because. There's ghost legends, there's ghost lores, there's a belief that spirits exist, so you can get away with so much with that kind of ability. With Howard the Duck, it's an alien mollard be literally beamed from his world all the way into ours. And even then, they didn't want to start with that um, explanation. They just wanted to straight up start with Howard's on Earth for no reason, and that's it. They just toss it in there because, oh, audiences are going to question why he's on Earth and all that sort of stuff. So... It was the worry of the viewers and how they're going to connect to the character and how they're going to translate the source from the way it is. Um, again, like I said, there are some things that do throw me for a loop. The the romance between him and Beverly, I think it would work better if they were like maybe roommates or something like that. Because in the comics, they were just friends. They were just cable uh, basic friends. There was no love tension or anything. Um, and yes, I have a copy of the DVD, Mike. It's fine. Um... I actually don't mind. I actually do not mind the uh, the romantic uh, subplot between the two of them. It just sort of seems like something that's that's played up as something kind of cute and harmless. But I have to, I do have to bring up. Uh, I, I do have to bring up because I was discussing this film uh, a weekend or so uh, uh, with a friend over at Comic Con. Uh, I, I said, you know what makes this particular love scene. Uh, particularly, uh, uh, particularly, uh, even more, in, even more comical. Uh, he says, I, "I, I, don't want, I don't want, uh, what is like?" I was like, "Do you know what a duck's anatomy is like?" And uh, oh and no, don't, like, don't, don't. He's just like, "Don't, I don't even know, want to know what a duck's anatomy is like." And I just said, "I just said meter stick. That is all." Anyway, moving on. Uh, oh, just, just... I was say yeah. I was saying you just say it's a corkscrew kind but, of. Uh... Oh god! Now that joke with the little tiny um, duck the makes condom. a lot more sense now. And yeah, they had to establish that in Not there. Not so, so small that... at all, isn't it? No. By the way, by the way, I just want to say, I just want to say for the record, speaking of which. When we get that opening where we're in Duck World, or whatever it's called, that photo of him in the field of marijuana and stuff, it's a random image, but I kind of like it for some reason. There's something so weird and interesting about it. It's like, wow. So we, everything about this movie is explained in just one little picture frame. Yeah, my uh, my relationship with the film as, as, uh, as a whole... I, I only saw the ending of it as a kid. I um, my my folks had recorded it on tape because as as one as one of those often scenarios where I say my folks recorded something on tape before they pulled the plug on their cable because they thought um, a movie with the title like Howard the Duck was going to be you know kind of a kind of a cute or harmless idea for the you know for the the kids might like it. Duck tits. <laughs> and well, they didn't have that in the TV edit. Oh, but happy um, bubbles. But in, but in any case, yeah, 
I'd only see the seen the ending of it. I watched the rest of it uh, when I was uh, when I was in high school, and um, I realized it is a it is a weird, bizarre movie with a with a, a fun charm to it. I I don't see it. It if you have a if you have maybe a, a somewhat of a different acquired taste, this is the type of movie for you. But you have to you have to look back on all the weirdness that that uh, that you see in this film that you that you dig through that people complain about, and you have to say, uh, how fun is your completely normal uh, adventure comedy sci-fi? Name me, give me one of those. <laughs> well, here, here's the point I'm trying to get across, because again, there is stuff I do like in this film. I like the punk 80s aesthetic, the fact that um, Beverly is now part of this rock band called the Cherry Bombs. In the comics, she was down on her luck and trying to pay the rent and stuff like that. Here, she's part of a band, so... It, it works for that era and stuff. The idea that they have these underground bands and trying to get together and stuff and make a living, like Purple Rain in the sense. Um, Thomas Dolby, like, thank you very much. Love you, Thomas. Um, he blinded us with science. Um, I like that idea because it definitely shows the Donner look kind of aspect. Um, Ed Gale, he's not perfect. I, I kind of wish they got him a little more sharper in a sense. Because the character is supposed to be a very cynical and sometimes nasty kind of person, almost like Donald Duck, if he was a little more like Deadpool. And I kind of wish they went in that direction because it would have been a little more interesting, because that was the whole idea. Earth is strange to him while Earth, while um, those around him think he's strange. And yet here they make him winsome, cuddly, and kind of heroic, which, yeah, I can see why they did that kind of aspect, because you want a likable character, not someone mean and nasty. Now we live in a day where we can have that acceptable, like Deadpool or Rocky Raccoon, because even as jerky as they are, there is a heart to them. They actually do have a sense of care. They just don't like showing it because they don't want to feel vulnerable, or they never have that aspect of you know being loved in a sense. Um, what really works for me is the second half of the film, even if it does get weird and really out there the idea that they accidentally bring down this whole other evil alien called the dark overlords <laughs> generic term but i like it for what it is and the fact that it possesses for principal scientist rudy from ferris bueller jeffrey jones very underrated actor i feel bad for the direction he went to but yeah. oh well that's his choice not mine it's I felt bad. He, he's such a great actor. Amadeus, Ferris Bueller, stay tuned. Um, oh well, that's his life, not mine. Um, Stuart but here Little. He is, oh yeah, I forgot about that one. But here he is just like really hamming it up when he does that voice. You know, I'm not Jennings anymore. That's his actual voice. There was no audio alterations. That was his actual voice just doing the whole growly thing. Kudos to him. Um, and the fact that he plans to bring in all these other evil aliens and everything. That's when the movie for me really kicks in a high gear. Not just because of the plot. Because here you have Howard trying to defend this planet that he's only known for like a few days. Just, just an entire few. It's just so out there, ridiculous. It's a sense where the movie is just trying to kick back and really get its kicks. Um, nowadays... We can accept that. We actually can accept that kind of thing. Prime example, back in 2004, and this sounds really ironic, we had another movie with this level of craziness and absurdity mm -hmm. called Guardians of the Galaxy. Now, here's the... 2004? Here, here, 2014, shut up. Um, I, I said 2014. I know my you ears. Said, you said 2004. Maybe it didn't register the teen part? Yeah, maybe okay, it was stuck 2014, moving on. <laughs> I live my... I... I'm mathematically challenged. Don't make fun of me. Um, anyway, so as I was saying... Let's put this in retrospective here. 1986, August 1st. The first Marvel comic adaptation. And it doesn't do well. Jump to 2000 
and 14 August 1st and we get Guardians of the Galaxy the same level of absurdity same craziness goes all out there and it does well it does spectacularly well and it, it reaches really its showed... audience yeah and even then um, we also had a sequel that came out and even though it's not plot heavy and it's more about its characters if it's interesting how in today's age we can take such really out there concepts and roll with it and do something with it and that's what I like about Marvel they take the most craziest things and they not only roll with it but they show there is a heart and center of the characters there is a connection that's why I think again DC's not doing so well because they want these prominent godlike beings and going to the ideology screw the ideology I want a character I want someone to connect to someone to appreciate and say okay I feel your pain because I had that same situation too and that's really quintessential with Guardians uh, 2 is we're not only seeing more of the characters we're having an understanding of the characters and their problems and their situations and that's why I love it so much and I think in today's age can a new Howard the Duck exist? And I say, yeah, if it's done right, if it's done perfectly. They have Seth Green cameoing as the character in the at, first at one. At the tail end of the first one. And, spoiler alert, he may oh. or may not. I said he may or may not. May or may not. May or may not. May or may not. So I didn't technically spoil it because I said may or may not. I said or. Or is a conjunction. You fool. Or. No, or is the thing that you use to paddle on a boat. Yeah, it's just. Or. 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 <laughs> it's okay. Put your put it on there. It's okay. Okay. Games? I didn't ruin it because I said or. Like a boat? <laughs> Damn it, James! <laughs> Damn it, James! <laughs> oh, let, me just, let me just take my medicine. I would also like to say that all things considered... Even Leah Thompson looks back on looks back on on this film with some fondness. Uh, and that's your thing I was going to bring up too. If the, you were, uh, the... there was a uh, there uh, there was a picture taken when she went to, when she did uh, Comic Con last year, and I remember Mike, you were the one who shared this uh, with the with the rest of the with the rest yeah, of us, I, I did, I did. Yes, I remember. Sure, I, f I found sure, this. Um, fan club. Yep, some some fan came up to her and it was just like, yeah. Sorry, go on, Morgan. What I was gonna say is, when you watch that movie, you can tell there are certain actors that are literally having a ball, and Leah Thompson being one of them, she knows it's not something you can't take serious. Mm -hmm. She's not trying to go for an Oscar. She's not trying to, you know, be dramatic or anything. It's a movie about a duck on Earth. What more do you want? But I think people didn't get the joke, and people did get the joke. When they test screened this movie, there was a mixed reaction, not surprisingly. Um, even though it was really mass market heavily, it was the first of its kind outside of Ghostbusters have its own telephone number where if you called it up you know the character would respond back to you and say oh hi I'm Howard this is my movie blah 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 um, but you know there is a call following I'm glad there are people out there that do get the idea and do get the joke is it perfect not 100% but for a mindless adventure that is pretty much a straight up B movie with a huge budget that's what I like the most of it. I think it would have been more interesting if it was a low-budget film. Um, I'm trying to think off the top of my head the how to compare it, because I don't want to say Ray Harry Housing, because that's a little... that's not a good place to start with. Um, but just, you know, a straight-up 80s B-movie, like The Wraith, for example. The, the Wraith did not have a big budget, but yet the charm of it is just how ludicrous and crazy the idea is. It's a killer car 
with a driver that was killed by a gang member that's back from the dead who's axing people off, and Clint Howard is in it. It's on Netflix. Go check it out. Um, it's quite essentially that kind of thing, and that's what I like about it. It's absurd. It's strange. It's weird. But for a relic of the time, and how they were banking on it and just really looking for the fun factor, that's what I like about it. And I think that's the same case here. If you hate this movie, I understand you. I understand why. Some people think it's too weird. Some people think it's too strange. Some people say it doesn't have a plot until the second half. I agree. I have a copy of the script. It was even far different. They had stuff like Howard trying to be their manager at one point, which would have been interesting. There's a whole sequence where they actually bring him to the lab. There's a chase sequence with him and the scientist, and he locks the scientist in this atom room and nearly kills him. I'm not even kidding. Um, but for what we got for the final version, it's enjoyable, but in a sense, I think a reboot is long overdue. Mm-hmm. If we can reboot Spider-Man twice within the same period of a decade or so, why not? Yeah. Give it a good one. That is. Uh, yeah, Seth Seth Green would be uh, uh, would be lined right up for that. I'm a little iffy about Seth Green because I think the voice is a little too gravelly, in a sense. I don't know why, because whenever I hear that, when I hear his rendition of Howard the Duck, it reminds me of Ed Bighead for some reason. Ah, uh, I see what you mean. Yeah. It, 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 it just sounds a little aesthetically off. Yeah, gross. I, I think, exactly. I think if you had someone like, say, um, well, that's not the tough thing. I really can't pinpoint Norm MacDonald, maybe? Like, like someone snarky, but James Woods. James Woods. James Woods. James Woods would be perfect. I, I think James Woods would be kind of perfect. He has that sarcasm feel to it, that slimy lawyer kind of role to it, and I, that that would be an interesting kind of choice. Maybe I'm I'm thinking way too out of the box, but what about Kevin Hart? Actually, that could work. I I, I, I you know Kevin Hart. He has a very manic personality to his comedy in Secret Life of Pets. And he can switch between manic and quiet. Um, I thought he was hilarious in Central Intelligence, him playing off of the rock. So, yeah, it's another contender. Okay. It helms God no. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I know, I know we're getting Cat in underpants, but my God, after seeing him in the Lorax, I'm a little concerned. Just, just a little. <laughs> Or how about just go go full out Danny's and can give us Howard? <laughs> Howard the Duck? What the fuck is that? I ain't playing no duck. You ain't getting me in no suit. I'd rather play a Pokemon instead of being a duck. <laughs> I'd rather be Detective Pikachu. <laughs> oh, lady. God, yeah, I, I can't I agree with Morgan because I do like the film I... too. I would also I would also like to say I did read some of the um I did read some of the comics in the revival they did. And it's actually kinda clever. They have him as a private detective and his secretary is She Hulk. His secretary is She Hulk? Beautiful, beautiful. This is a great running gag where Spider Man is trying to help him out and he keeps failing. <laughs> so whenever he thinks Howard's dead, he's like Oh, Uncle Ben. Oh, God, Uncle Ben. No, I failed you. Because <laughs> if you remember in the very first issue of Howard, him and Spider-Man did meet up at one point, believe it or not. Mm. Mm. That's a crossover. Yeah. And that's why I like. It's the tongue-in-cheek, subtle kind of aspect. It's not going full force like, oh, Christ Almighty, Phil Lord and Chris Miller, where they're throwing joke throwing joke throwing joke no i like subtlety i like slyness i like cleverness not oh and that's the end of the second act oh that's kind of ironic because we're at the end of the second act of the movie <laughs> make something original yeah howard has has uh, sort of uh has sort of been uh uh, he's sort of gotten cameo dropped left and left and right here and there over the years. I remember showing you that uh, 
I remember. Do you remember me showing you that uh, that one clip from that that recent Spider-Man cartoon where he made a cameo? Yes. Yes, I I, I, I remember a little of that. That's I remember just... who voiced him. It might, it might have been Kevin Michael Richards' voice. I could be wrong. Uh, Spider-Man breaks into uh, breaks into a laboratory looking for something he can use as a as a science experiment. And he's like, do this, do that. He comes across Howard. And Howard just goes, hey, I'm warning you, I know quack foo. Yep, actually, Morgan was right. It was Kevin Michael Richardson. Ultimate, Sp Ultimate Spider-Man. Yep. And Spider-Man's like, uh, too weird. <laughs> uh... Oh, one more thing I want to say about Guardians 2. Best Stanley cameo, and I'm leaving it at that. Mm. I mean, okay, in Deadpool, he was the head of a stripper club, but here, it works beautifully. Okay. 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 Alright. There is a possibility I could be this weekend, so we'll see. Warning, there are five post-credits. Yeah, I heard, like, four of them, middle, one of them. Yeah, there's the four, end. middle, one, one at the end. That's also great. Alright, got it. All right, cool. At least I'll know this time. Yes. Of... Oh yeah, so you won't miss Howard the Duck's cameo like you did in the first one. So no, no they that didn't. Was, didn't it? So... No, it was the it was the whole Godzilla part with uh, Kong Skull Island. Oh. Oh, that's right. I remember. I was sitting there like I'm waiting for the post credit. What? what there's a post credit? <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah, give me some credit for going online and looking for a pirated version. So, uh, so it's not like it's not like Clue where they release different versions of the movie with different post-credit scenes. Oh, apparently Seth Green has voiced Howard before in Spider-Man. Ultimate Spider-Man? Uh, yeah, it's the episode Return of the Spider-Verse where there's a pirate version of Howard and he's voiced by Seth Green. A pirate version? Huh. I'm as bewildered as you are. Interesting. Mm. Like, what is he as a pirate? Like a parrot? <laughs> I don't know, but it's a cartoonish pirate reality, apparently. Hmm. Well, because like, Marvel does have those multiple universes. And apparently there's also pirate versions of Rocket and Groot in that universe. Huh. I can see Rocket as a pirate, actually. With what he does in the sequel, I agree with you. Okay. I'm leaving you mm. that. That could mean a lot of things. Yes. Well, uh, well they... Uh, well, they were... Uh, 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 they were uh, hitmen for uh, hire. So... Moving on, we have one movie left. Unfortunately, I gotta wake up early, so if anyone needs me, I'm gonna dream about a three-way between Rose McGowan, Zoe Saldad, and Crystal from Star Fox. Enjoy that. You have fun with that. And the cherry on it all, Dan Stevens in the corner with a video camera recording the whole thing. And be with me forevermore. No, no, it'd be, it'd be more like it's like, Oh, what, 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 what? No, what no, no, no. I, no, while Dan Stevens is filming, he's doing that stupid, ugly grin as the bee's just like. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, show that, that, that damn smile! <laughs> Bad is the one time I had my car become all herby eyes and it tries to enter an elevator and the trunk gets crushed. Oh, yeah. Don't Ouch. ask how. That was. Ugh. All right. Until next time. Push the button, Frank. <laughs> <laughs> okay.
<sighs> so there we go. We got, ladies and gentlemen, you got your Morgan Ledger. Uh, so, yeah, I figured I start, I mean, go last because this film I strangely enjoy and everyone else just fucking hates it. Like, it's not a guilty pleasure for me. It's just, I appreciate it for what it is. And, uh, that film came out in 2012, that film being Battleship. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, here's the thing. I p- Hasbro wanted to make a movie out of Battleship. And they wanted to do it in a way where it's not just your typical kind of boring war kind of naval ship movie where they're playing Battleship together back and forth shooting missiles at each other. Battleship, in its whole, is about, uh, of course, this naval... uh, You have this one character named Hopper, Alex Hopper, played by Taylor Kitsch. And, of course, 2012 was a big year for Taylor Kitsch, because not only he was in Battleship, he was also in John Carter the same year. And he he was also... Oh, I don't know if if you would call that a big year. For acting wise, acting wise, like he had like three movies that year, so it was like I went, I'm saying big year as in having movies come out that year, not just like box office wise. Um, but you know, I I appreciate Taylor Kitsch. He's kind of like underrated. Like he 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 can act, but with the right script, it could be either bad or good. Like the, I can, I, I with the script for Battleship, I can understand why people don't like it because the story of it is just way too convoluted. Because it's like, wait a minute, is this a Battleship movie? Why is this a Battleship movie? This, why does this involve this? Because he, what Battleship is, basically, is first off, you get this love story between, not love story, but you kind of have this introduction of Alex Hopper, this bum kind of character played by Taylor Kitsch. He's, he falls in love with Brooklyn Decker, who's in this movie. She wants a chicken burrito. And the whole first scene sets up that he uh, falls in love with her and tries to impress her by giving him a chicken burrito. Since the bar he was at doesn't serve chicken burritos, the kitchen was closed. So he goes to a convenience store at the beginning, and <laughs> I swear. It looks like a chicken burrito. He goes to, because yeah, the, the store was closed, and he goes, you know, sk- kind of goes inside, gets a chicken burrito, and meanwhile, as he's, like, falling through the roof, you know, he falls twice on his back, but as the, as they do that scene, they play the Pink Panther theme <laughs> for some strange fucking reason, but I fucking enjoy it because it's just, like, it, it kind of fits the mood very well. It's, like, he's trying to be sneaky, you know, Pink Panther's kind of got that sneaky vibe to it when it comes to the music. And the whole scene, the whole scene was a, was a recreation of an actual robbery that happened that completely... That completely that completely uh, went wrong. Yeah. And I remember and I remember watching that original video and and laughing my ass off. But here I'm just sort of wondering, I, I'm I'm just sort of scratching my head like Pink Panther, really? I don't know. It's a it's a like a unique choice at most. But so yeah, they set this up because the father of Brooklyn Decker is Liam Neeson, and he has to like get his approval to marry her as like that's that's a subplot right there but meanwhile they're in hawaii doing his naval exercise you know trying to be this you know trying to shoot each other out you know trying to practice being in the navy kind of thing you know using the equipment being on the ship uh we're in the navy we shoot each other we're gonna practice shooting each other yeah, we're in the Navy, you know, this is like a competition, this is like an annual competition, you know, this this exercise, we have every country in the world, you got Japan, well, there's a soccer, there's a thing too, there's there's a soccer match they go to, like, there's a naval soccer match, like, they do every year too, and they played against Japan, and they lost, because, you know, uh, Taylor Kitsch was playing soccer, he got kicked in the face, he didn't want to get kicked out, he wanted to be in the game, and he had to do this final kick to, win, to lose the game, blah, blah, that's fucking final uh subplot of that um so all right it, it, it just sets up a lot of bullshit i mean it is i, I agree it, it it takes a long time to set it up because at the beginning you see that nasa has built this beam that would broadcast or show out a signal to 
a familiar planet in another galaxy that has the same kind of atmosphere as us called Planet G. And so they set that up so that when that does happen, you uh, you understand that they got the signal and the aliens come our way and start to attack us. And yes, there's aliens involved in Battleship. And yeah. That, eh. Let that sink in. Aliens in a, in a movie based on the game Battleship. So, and it's not like, it's not like it's based on the Battleship Galactic version, because there's a Galactic version of Battleship. So it's like, it's like street, it's, it's loosely based as it is, and loosely. loosely, very loosely. And how can you base on something that doesn't have a story to begin with? And that's the thing, like, I was thinking about, it's like, would you want to see a, a, a straightforward Battleship movie where they're just fighting each other back and forth? Like, this kind of, like, very, like, a thriller-esque kind of movie. But, you know, this is, like, catered to, like, young, like, a young demographic. Like, it's, like, I imagine this being, I, I kind of think of this as, like, Top Gun meets, like, Transformers. Because you have the Top Gun aspect being they're showing the Navy in a glorified way so people can, the, the young men watching this be like, hey, I want to join the Navy. Just like how the Top Gun was for the Air Force. And then Transformers because Peter Berg, who directed this, kind of like took elements from Transformers in a way because you have these big spherical, like these sphere orbital balls that come through and shave everything down like these shredder balls and they look like transformers in a way it's like they come around and start attacking everything and uh so there's the way that the ship the way that the alien ships also operate is is very much uh is is very much uh Transformers-esque, I think. Yeah. And see, what happens is that the uh, the ship that Taylor Kitsch uh, is running, they discover this ship. They don't know what it is. They go out there on a boat. And mind you, Rihanna is on the same ship, too. This is Rihanna's first acting debut in a movie. And she does an okay job. Like, I, I can agree that's not the greatest performance, but it's just like it's her first role for crying out loud. The other reason why she was cast is because the director thought, she saw the, the director saw the interview that she was having about her ex-boyfriend, Chris Brown, and he was like, you know, if you could dodge an interview like that, you can act. So I was like, okay, okay, fine. You cast her? That's not my thing. And... Of course, the ship that these people discover, they it broadcasts a huge sky beam into the air and makes a force field around the ships. So no nobody else outside the dome can go in and, and attack. So throughout this whole time, we're trying to, like, uh, attack the ship, you know, try to get into it, you know, like, try to get rid of it, shooting at it, you know, tactical things. And there's, like, another subplot where... Brooklyn Decker is a physical therapist and he is helping this guy out who has like uh, titanium legs. He's trying to walk on his legs for the first time ever since whatever incident happened to him, like d during the war maybe. And he, they become like okay, kind of a part of it on land trying to help out the people trying to get rid of these aliens, you know, and these aliens come by and they discover that these aliens or have this, like, humanoid, like, laser, lizard-like appearance. Because they have, like, four fingers in a way, like a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle, and then they had eyes like a lizard, and... They're... But then, don't worry, like, they would then go, No, 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 wait, hold on, it's just a mess, it's just a mess, <laughs> see? And then cue the clip of, Somebody once told me the world is gonna rule me. <laughs> Looks like Shrek underneath. Yeah, the. Yeah, I, I, I can understand. I can understand why you, why you enjoy this film. Uh, I, I will say this because I did see. We we did sit down and watch this earlier this week just, uh, just for research sake and. My impression of it of it is very much popcorn uh i uh 
I actually uh, the the one thing that I think it's got going for it are the are the battle scenes. It's very it's very much a it's very much a, a blockbuster uh, a sort of a, oh if this if this movie is uh, on television while you're while you're scanning through channels and there's an awesome sequence going on. Yeah, you can go ahead and watch that, but the story was so dumb. It's, yeah. The story is the thing that really hurts this. I mean, yeah, I can, like, but that's the thing. I don't even pay attention to the story that much because I what what it is for me is a great blockbuster popcorn flick. Like, I enjoy what they did. They know sometimes it doesn't make sense, but, you know, it's kind of like, oh, I can see why they did that. Oh, that's pretty cool. And, oh, oh whoa, okay, okay, that's they're doing something creative with it. I mean... I just, okay. it's not a guilty pleasure for me. I just, I, because a lot of people just hate it because, oh, really? Aliens? Why? Why, why, why? And it's like, dude, think about it. Think, Just imagine you're the executives and thinking, how do we adapt Battleship into the movie? While catering do to, it like, while catering to, like, do it like uh, the hunt for Red October while, or something like that. While catering to a young demographic who have played the game. The young demographic, they don't play Battleship anymore. By the oh, way, guys, they? can I ask a big question? Since you guys have seen the movie, is the line there? You know exactly what I'm talking about. You sunk my Battleship? Yes. It is not in the movie. And okay, then it sucks, then. <laughs> yeah. It, um, uh, that, okay, so there's a missed opportunity, but not even think. I'm not even thinking about that while watching. I, let's... Let's say that for uh, for whatever purpose, you know, aliens. Okay, let let you know. Let's go with this. And we had a discussion about this. Uh, um, what uh, what kind what kind of sense uh, is is this is this movie trying to make? These aliens come. Uh, these aliens come uh, from one solar system to another uh, to attack planet Earth uh, for a reason that is so barely given that uh, that uh, it took Mike, Mike explaining it afterward uh, to make sense of it. And their, their attack plan is land in the ocean and have a sea battle. Uh, with a with a select group of with a select group of battleships, um, we the reason the reason why War of the Worlds works, the reason why uh, the reason why Independence Day works, the reason the reason why Mars Attacks works, the reason why so many alien invasion films work, is because the concept of coming out of the sky and flying vehicles makes sense. Or, or at least makes the most sense. Maybe not so much uh, Spielberg's War of the Worlds because uh, really you, you buried those things a million years ago uh, and, uh, and now you're just coming back for them. But, um, but yeah, uh, you could attack anywhere. Why would you choose to, to limit your attack plan at sea? And uh, moving forward with that, you have to wonder, okay, the one weakness that these guys have, uh, despite their humanoid design, is that they can't see, they can't see light outside. Uh, uh, the sunlight is just completely blinding to them. And that's a, that's a weakness that we exploit, uh, that the Navy exploits. Um, uh, okay, so that explains why their suits are, uh, their their helmets are shaded and everything. Uh, you, uh, why would you attack, why would you attack another another planet with that, uh, where the dominant species uh, had that advantage over you? It's a, it's, it's a, it's a, comp they, we have a complete sensory advantage over our enemy, despite all these guys whiz bang technology. 
And then when the explanation comes in, oh boy, the explanation for the attack, it opens up such a world of dumb. Uh, we were having a field day with it. Uh, the... Yes, the... The spoiler, spoiler alert, the message that we sent out, which was probably uh, a radio signal, at, at, at the very least, somehow, somehow in this film, it's a, it's a freaking laser. We shot out a, out a message with a space, a space laser, and it punched a hole in the, it, it punched a hole in our planet on the other end. <laughs> yeah, that's what it is basically, because it's not like a beam, it's like a freaking laser they shoot out. Like, that's not like a radio signal, it's weird, because, like, it's very brief, like, it's very fucking brief, because when they first encounter the alien, uh, Taylor Kitsch opens the helmet up, and he kind of looks at the eyeball, because it's like, oh, look at this, it's like a lizard-like alien, and it wakes up like, ah, and it starts attacking Taylor Kitsch, and all of a sudden, Taylor Kitsch... Oh, Alex Hopper looks into the eye of the creature and you see like this very, very fucking brief moment where you see their planet and you see like war going on and like shit like that. And it's like, you're, you're thinking, wait, is that because of us? Did we do that? And is that why they're here? That could be the explanation, but it's very brief though. So it's like they're coming down to attack us just because of that. It's like, oh, you shoot at us? Oh, we're coming down to attack you. You know, we're trying to intercept our signal like that. And so co- this me this this means that the aliens were completely in the right for attacking us. Yeah, <laughs> yes. exactly. Because we made a we made a boo boo. Why, why would you do? Why would you shoot? What what kind of message are are you radio radioing out there when you blast a laser across? It's like we come in peace. <laughs> It's, it's like, yeah, it's like, I don't know what they, it, that's the, the explanation they brought us to us, because it's it's not like the planet was, like, like that before, they just show that in, in the creature's eye, it's like, oh shit, war has happened because of that, it's like, shit, did we actually shoot a laser beam, or was that actually a signal for contact? Uh, it's a Vulcan mind, it's a Vulcan mind meld moment between these two. <laughs> uh, yeah, by the way, there is one thing that I want to add about um, Battleship, even though I haven't seen the movie, I remember the time period like, during the time before it was released, and the best way to describe it is that back in 2012, like it was the emoji movie of its time, and I remember mm-hmm. because this was the one that people were blasting it and they were hating it just because of the mere concept of this idea. Like, Mike, you were arguing that, like, uh, a defense would be like, well, how else would you do uh, a battleship movie that would be geared towards a young demographic? That's exactly what people hate about it. Is that it's the fact that it's a battle, it's a movie based on the battleship game that's trying to take itself very seriously, and that it's trying to target a young demographic that it has such a huge budget and like it's a it's a plot where it like the Navy has to fight against aliens. Like, everything about it is just purely stupid. And it was one of those things that people immediately declared that Hollywood is purely running out of ideas, down to the point that they're so desperate to make a movie, rather it be about emojis or about this Hasbro board game about Battleship. Like, that's mostly the explanation. It's a little bit of emoji movie complex where... It's just people hate it just by its mere existence and how it came out. Well, of course it became a flop because nobody really wanted to go and see a freaking battleship movie. I mean, how? I'm like, sorry, but we just have to we just have to acknowledge that uh, the world is not ready for it. I, I mean, yeah, a lot of people. I mean, the world is not ready for a movie based on a board game. <laughs> I mean. I mean, it's that's the thing. Ahead of its time, that's the excuse. <laughs> no, 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 no. Let's make. We should make. We should totally do Risk the movie. That would be. That would make an interesting. 
No, that movie is gonna last eight hours. <laughs> <laughs> it's gonna be the the Doctor Zagar- Zagaro of the movie. Just like have a three hour cut of it. Like it's just a long ass movie. Like oh my god. Uh, One piece, the the new millennium edition. <laughs> it's I mean um, I mean that's the thing. It's like we're getting into this new territory where yeah, Hollywood's have run out of ideas, but you know, board games do have that concept where you you're playing a game and there's a story element to it. Sometimes I know Battleship. I, I, but even like adding in stuff like aliens is a little bit ridiculous. It, it, it is, it is. But I was going to say Battleship does not really have a story element to it. It's just the basic back and forth game of battling, you know, fighting each other, like kind of thing. But really, why is there a point to make a game, to make a, a movie based on that? I don't, and that's the thing. It just, it perplexes me of that as a whole. But that's the thing. Like, you. I mean, Battleship is a very popular game. That's and Hasbro might have been selling that game for years, and it's making them profit. It's like, oh, look at this! This is our most pro- popular property. Let's make that into a movie. Kind of like how Clue Clue got it made into a movie. It's like that's popular. <laughs> so, I mean, then you know, I guess you know, I guess they don't do board games anymore because it's just like that's a failed concept. But see, going with Aliens for me, it just made me think, oh, they were trying to do something different with it instead of just doing a simple, run-of-the-mill kind of typical story that you do with Battleship. I, it has great action set pieces. The characters, yeah, the characters are meh at most, but every character goes through an arc. They learn something at the end of the movie. They, they become something different by the time they go to the end of the movie. They learn something over the end of it. Um, I mean, yeah, it's just... I just uh, enjoy and the and the soundtrack, the score of it was amazing. The soundtrack and the score was amazing. I mean, there's a couple times where they played ACDC in the movie. It was great, you know. They did that. It's like there's a montage moment where, I mean, because th- at the end, their last resort, uh, spoiler alert, to fight off the aliens is they have one battleship left, and it's the USS Mississippi, I believe, and it's it was turned into a museum, and so now they like they have to turn it back into a, a battleship, and they hire. They, and then they have this ragtag crew of veterans who were like during World War II or something to come back to you know run this battleship to fight off these aliens for one last hurrah. And they play uh, Thunderstruck by ACDC at that moment for the montage. Yeah, I'm gonna give I will give this I will give this movie that much. It, as cheesy as that as that one moment is where we where you have all these. All those, uh, all those aged World War II veterans coming up and marching in slow motion like it's, uh, like it's Armageddon. Uh, you, I, I, you, you, you did say some of them, some of the, some of the actors were actual veterans. Yeah, some were, some were. Some were actual veterans. <laughs> so, when you look, when you think about it in that, in that concept, you have to sort of think, okay, so. It's a it's a nice little it's a it's a, a nice little uh, tip of the hat to the uh, to our men and women in uniform. Yeah. And that I can totally respect. And there's something that like I said also when we were watching the movie I I totally found I totally find awesome about just a bunch of old guys coming coming out of the woodworks there. They came out of nowhere. Yeah, they did. They came out of nowhere. It was like, wait, this ship's not gonna work. The ship's not gonna work. And all of a sudden, you say, and you hear the thunder. It's like, nah, 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 and they come walking out. It's like, yeah, we're here to save the day. <laughs> uh, but it's a, it's a, a climax with a bunch of old guys uh, kicking ass. How could you not love this? Yeah, I mean, and, yeah. Bunch, so old, like the way to destroy aliens is by old people. Well, with. <laughs> hey, my grandfather was a naval pilot. Do not disrespect. And the, and that's the thing, with the director Peter Berg doing this project, he wanted it to dedicate it to the people that were in the force at the time because his father was in the navy too. So he was inspired to do, to do Battleship because of that. And he wanted to put that element into the movie to respect your elders and respect the people who were in the force, whether it's the army, air force or Navy, or even the Marines or whatever force it was. The problem, the problem is they, they just, they just 
had they they should have done it with a with a better story is my thing. And yeah. I mean, but I appreciate for what they did with it because mm-hmm. I understand that they could have done it better with the story, but what they with the end product I think that was a valiant elf effort. Like everything looks nice in it. There's some great shots in it. That it's set in Hawaii, which of course, as he was watching, it's like, wait, this is like Jurassic Park and Jurassic World all over again because it's set in Hawaii. It's like it looks like it's on the set of Jurassic World or something. So it did. It very much did. So and as it, and after this coming after the rest of this year, we'll be able to say that this movie looks like the set of Jumanji two. <laughs> Welcome to the jungle. Oh dear God. Uh, I just uh, it, it just for me it has a charm and I love to watch it whenever it's on and it's just it makes me laugh. It has great action and it's just interesting as a movie as a whole. We also neglected to mention they did they did do they, they did at least incorporate some of the game's elements. Yeah, the... that's true. And they, they, they yeah, I, was, I, was, I totally forgot to mention that because they tried to add the elements of the game. The, the one that I, di- I love the fucking most is that when the aliens shoot off their ammunition, uh, ammo, they shoot out these big, like, bombs, and they're shaped like a peg, and they have, like, a yellow stripe around it. And we had this discussion, too, afterwards. It's like, wait a minute. The game had red and red pieces, and I was like, no, the my game, the, when I played the game, it had yellow pieces, so it was like, whatever game you played, I guess they were going for, like, the version that had the yellow pieces, so they actually shot yellow pegs at the battleship to sink the battleship. Maybe they, maybe they could have also had red and yellow uh, pieces in there just to... Uh, just to uh, just to say, okay, this uh, this particular type of peg does this to the battleship, and this this is like a napalm bomb or something, something like that. Oh. It was, but that I just I just loved it when they just shot it off, and all of a sudden you see it sunk in, sunk it's like sink right into the battleship, like to the top, and you see it like coming through, and it's like had a yellow ring around. It's like oh my god, it's like the game. Mm-hmm. Um, and then yeah, and, and then at the very end, like the only way they could like take down the ship one way was uh there's a japanese officer and there was a way that they could like sonar it in by bowie buoys on the waterfront and they had to do like signal and it comes up with a grid and there's a big grid on the screen and so you can actually they're like okay let's go over here to blah 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 and they go like shoot it at that location like battleship yeah kind of it kind of vaguely resembles the game although we know an actual battleship uh you can't see your opponent period exactly so i mean like i said it gave it gives it so much like they try to put elements in they try to do something with it and i fucking love it okay you can have it yeah, you... You can, it's yours. <laughs> matt you you say that like you're in complete defeat over this <laughs> You're at, a, you're at a loss of words now. It's like, well, I don't know. It's like, real, well, honestly, do I, do I really want to go and compete and fight over freaking Battleship? <laughs> I mean, the movie itself, like I said, the movie, the, the mere idea and the mere existence of this movie is purely stupid. Am I really going to go and try to fight? Like, like to go and have like this big battle over freaking Battleship the movie. I don't oh. know what's stupider, the movie itself or trying to have an argument over it. Oh. Oh, but it gets even better. Yeah. The same crew, the same crew is uh, is coming together later for Mousetrap, the movie, and uh, and uh, the villains are going to be alien cats. <laughs> oh, you're just... <laughs> <laughs> Got you! Uh, <laughs> uh, it sounds so convincing at first. I was like, wait a minute, really? Actually, you know the funny thing is, is that technically there already is a mousetrap movie. Well, almost. There's one well, scene because there's actually one scene in the Boss Baby where they at, where like they wanted to set up an entire trap for Tim and the Alec Baldwin baby. So they actually recreated like the entire board of mousetraps. <laughs> I forgot to mention though that Battleship does have a post-credit scene. Oh yeah. 
yeah. setting up for a sequel where they oh yeah sure because people are excited for Battleship 2, two. god I would... we'll have the big like Hasbro board game cinematic universe I mean I mean yeah why not go into the world of Candyland for <laughs> also meeting Mr. Monopoly while you're having a freaking operation <laughs> It was interesting because there's this like like they they set the post credit scene in Scotland, so there's like these boys like it's like oh what is this they start smacking each other to open it up, and then this one guy pulls up, this one guy pulls up and he looks like Nick Frost like the actor is like canning to Nick Frost it was weird so he's open it up and all of a sudden spoiler alert they left the alien behind so there's like oh no a sequel. This- so it's like. What are we gonna do with our one alien left? In the sequel. I don't know. What, what, how was that? Think it. Uh, think it with the my battleship. It's like set in Scotland, so it's like the Loch Ness battleship kind of thing. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That it, uh, folks, that is the podcast. This is Cinema Royale. Next time, like I said, we're going to do the reverse thing with this topic. We're going to talk about movies that we hate, but everyone loves. So it's going to be interesting to talk about that topic next time in the next two weeks. So leave a comment below. What is your movie that you love but everyone hates? Also, please give this a like. Share the people that would probably enjoy this episode. Give this a like. And, uh, yeah, follow me on my social medias. Follow these guys on Twitter because they probably have a lot of good discussions about anything. Uh, and give this a like. Give this a fucking like. Just like, like, like. Give it a like. Like it. Smash that like button like a boss. <laughs> That's all he jabs at the guy. What the fuck? <laughs> uh, other than that, thanks for listening. Long live cinema. Adios, amigos. Out for Groot. <laughs> <laughs>